In this video, you're going to see a game that illustrates how to use what's called the Pillsbury attack. This was a game played by the man himself, Harry Nelson Pillsbury, who invented this attack. He was the kind of the pioneer who showed people how dangerous this could be. Because originally D4 was kind of considered, a, you know, positional opening. You can't really attack the king and stuff. But actually, if you play the Pillsbury attack, you can. All right. And that's what we're going to see in this example. So if you're a D4 player, if you like to play the Queen's Gambit or even just some other openings, the ideas that we see here are going to be able to be applied. Okay. So the Pillsbury attack starts with the move Knight to E5. And I am going to show you how we ended up in this position and talk about everything leading up to this. But this is the critical move that sets in motion the Pillsbury attack where you follow it up with F4 and you launch a very dangerous attack on the king side. OK, so let's jump back to the beginning, see how we ended up here and let's go from there. This is episode 22 in a series where we're going through this book, Logical Chess, move by move. Let's go ahead and just get started. So we have D4, D5 and a queen's gambit. Black can accept the gambit if they want. Take the pawn. You can always get your pawn back when you play the queen's gambit. But in this case, they decide to play E6, which is called the queen's gambit declined. Okay, They decline to take the pawn. Knight to c3, knight to f6, attacking, defending d5, makes a lot of sense, and bishop to g5. Now, Pillsbury liked to put the bishop on g5. Not everybody agreed with him uh, back in the day when he played this. I don't recall exactly the date, but it was very early in uh, the chess you know, world. And so he, he was kind of the pioneer for this, but it turned out very well for him. And he got some really nice aggressive positions, which we're going to see. Okay. And the threat is obvious, like you're, you're lining up here, you're creating a pin, and you're threatening to just win a pawn. So for example, something like this, you can simply take, 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 and you just you just win the pawn because you lured the queen away. And if the queen doesn't take you, you have to mess up your pawns, right? That's kind of the idea. So there is a little trap here that black can play. It's a very common one. Knight B to D7. And it looks like, wait a second, black just blundered a, a piece, blundered a pawn here. We just take... There's a pin. They don't want to lose their queen, so I'm just going to take the pawn for free, right? No, wrong. They sacrifice the queen because bishop to b4 check. We've showed this before, I believe, in this series. Queen d2, now you trade, and when the dust settles, black has three pieces and white only has two. Okay, I just wanted to show you that. That's not what happened in this game. Black didn't even try that trap, but it does exist, and I just wanted you to be aware. Okay, so if you're a Queen's Gambit player, watch out if you see knight b to d7. But in the game, black decided to go bishop e7 instead, just breaking the pin right away, which is totally fine. e3, and he mentioned something here in the book. He says, pawns, you want to minimize your pawn moves, okay, at the start of the game. However, if a pawn is blocking a piece from being developed, you have to move that pawn. It's part of your development process, okay? So keep that in mind. This is a very different pawn than f3, g3, h3, b3, or a3, right? Those moves. This one is required to let the bishop out unless you're going to be in keto, but you get the idea, right? It's okay to move pawns if you're letting pieces out. Castles, knight to f3, b6. So since black's bishop is stuck here, he's trying to fi and keto it over here, which makes a lot of sense. Bishop to d3. Now black plays the move bishop to b7. Now, bishop to b7, I feel like you could do better, right? Because if you want your bishop to be active along this diagonal, why not go ahead and trade? Cause this bishop to waste some time and then you go bishop e7 and now you're controlling all this and that bishop looks amazing right so i think that's one thing that black could have done and by not doing that you allow white to trade and after their pawn recaptures the bishop is now stuck okay now if you're black you could have taken with the knight which maybe was a little bit better then your bishop is going to remain open however you do walk into the, the problem of e4 at some point and white's going to get this nice big center. And it's still kind of an interesting position. The engine actually says this was a better move for black. Okay. But in the game, they decided to recapture with the pawn, trying to keep control of the e4 square. So right here uh, is where white launches what's called the Pillsbury attack. Okay. So if you plug this in on chess.com, you're going through the moves. It says Queen's Gambit declined, modern variation. And as soon as you play the move 95, that's called the Pillsbury attack. Now, this is you know, it just looks like, okay, we're just putting the knight in the center of the board, not a big deal. Actually, what you're doing is clearing the way for the F pawn to go forward, which is really going to help you attack on the king side. Okay, we're going to talk more about that as we keep going. So knight B to D7 and F4. Now, what F4 really does is discourages black from trading. 
okay? Because if they decide to trade now, you're gonna capture with the F pawn. Now the knight has to move somewhere. Let's just say it goes back here. And look at this, and look at this, and you even have H4 if you want, or you could castle and use this F file for your rook, bring the rook up and up. There's so many options that, that you can do here, and it's a very dangerous situation for black, okay? Because you've allowed the rook into the game very easily. So that's kind of the point behind the Pillsbury attack. It's, it's not that easy for black to just trade your knight on E5 now, okay? And having a knight at the center of the board is very, very powerful. Also, um, once you castle, or if you castle, you can do a rook lift, bring the rook up and over, and you attack this way, okay? This is actually very similar to the stonewall setup. So if you're a stonewall player as white, usually your pawn structure would look like this. In this case, there's a knight on C3 instead of a pawn, but other than that, it's very similar to a stonewall. So some of the ideas are going to apply there as well. Okay, so here we go. Pillsbury attack. Let's see how it plays out in practice. So black plays a good move. C5, trying to counterattack, put some pressure on, on white's pieces. And white simply castles, gets the king to safety. And also, like I said, you can now start to think about using your rook if that's what you want to do. And here is where black makes, I would say, the first critical mistake of the game. Okay, they play the move C4. Now, you might say, oh, that's, that makes sense. They're gaining space. They're attacking the bishop. They're doing it with the tempo. That's cool. The problem, and he mentions this in the book, is it's a strategic mistake because you immediately relieve the tension in the center. There is no longer any pressure or any option to do anything in the center of the board. What does that mean? That means white can now focus 100% of their energy and efforts on checkmating you on the king side, essentially. And you can't do anything about it, right? If you leave the pawns here, there's always this idea that like you might take, and then if you can somehow, you know, this is a slow plan, but you get the idea of like bring the queen over here, you attack here, you're threatening my king. At least you have some sort of a plan to maybe create counterplay. I'm not saying that's a good plan, but you get the idea. When you play C4, you can't attack this anymore. It's defended by a pawn. Even if you attack it, you can't do anything. There's, there's literally no chance for anything to happen in the center when it's locked up which means now you better hope you're good at defending because it's it's gonna you're gonna get attacked, right? So that's kind of the problem, okay, with c4. So bishop goes back to c2, stays on this diagonal. Notice he didn't go back to e2 because why would you want your bishop here when you could have it here attacking the king, right? Makes a lot of sense. Black plays a6. Now, black has a plan, which is good. The problem is it's a very slow plan. They're going to go a6 and b5 and b4 and try to push these pawns forward. And okay, it, it's something. They probably thought that their position was so solid. They didn't have anything to worry about. The problem is white's attack is going to ramp up very quickly. And you're going to see how dangerous the Pillsbury, Pillsbury attack is. Okay, so the move is played. that's played is queen f3. Now, queen f3 is actually a really nice move for two, a couple of reasons. Number one, you connect your rooks. Okay, so if this guy needs to come over, which we will see in the, the future, uh, he can do that. You're also lining up on this bishop, which is really nice because the bishop's undefended. So for example, you're threatening to simply take this pawn, for example, something like this, right? You just win a pawn, okay? And you might consider coming over here to line up on h7, right? You couldn't do that before because there's a knight sitting here who would just take you, but now you can go over to h3. And so you have all these ideas uh, just by playing queen f3, okay? So black plays b5, which is kind of what they wanted to do anyway, and it, they at least deal with the pawn here, so you can't take like we just talked about. All right, so if you guys want to pause here, this is a good moment. What do you think Pillsbury did now to continue the attack? All right, critical move in the game here, and it's queen to h3. So I kind of gave you a hint. I said that was one of the ideas, right? But the question is, why is this such a powerful move? So again, it's a really good time for you to pause and try to figure out why this is such a powerful move. All right, so the reason this is so good is because if black ignores it, for example, with a move like, um, let's just say a5, we can simply take here. And once we take, black has a tough decision because if you take with the knight, you get checkmated right away. And if you take with the queen, I'm gonna take here with check. If you move the knight, you lose your queen. If you don't move the knight and you move your king, then I'm going to go back here with check and I'm going to take your queen with the bishop because there's a discovered check. So it, his position just falls apart, essentially. Okay, So this idea of knight takes d7 is going to win the game for white if black doesn't deal with it. So that's why they played queen h3. And the way that you would want to think about this would be something along the lines of this. All right. 
Let's say I go queen h3. Ooh, it's almost checkmate. That's really nice. Okay, there's a knight sitting on f6, though. What if I just take the knight? Because then I'll have checkmate. Ah, but this knight is going to recapture, and then I have the same problem. Okay, so what if I undermine that knight? That seems pretty good. But if you do it right now, the queen takes, and I can't even go there. I can't go there. I can't go there. I can't go there. I have no way to get my queen to attack. Too bad. So what do you do instead? Oh, I can go queen h3 first. Now I'm threatening to take that. I'm threatening here. Yeah, that seems like a really powerful move. Okay, that would be the thought process that your brain should go through to come up with this move, all right? So black wisely notices what's going on and, and deals with it by playing the move g6, which is the best move according to Stockfish. However, for those of you who have been following the series for a while, you know what I'm gonna say about that move, right? It is, um, it creates weaknesses, it creates weaknesses on the dark squares, okay? Yes, you block the bishop and you deal with the checkmate, but now you have these permanent weaknesses and we'll see if white's able to take advantage of that as the game goes on. So again, if you would like to pause, what move do you think white played next? All right, if you had a chance to think about that, the move is F5. And another idea of the Pillsbury attack is that because you have that pawn there, if you need it, you can use it to bust through. Okay, and this is a good idea to keep in the mind when, in the back of your mind when you're attacking. If your pieces are all set up in a nice position, but you can't seem to get through, do you have any pawns that you can use to, as sort of like a battering ram or like something to just kind of trade and chip away at the defensive structure, essentially, is what he's doing, and make way for all the pieces. Notice you also get the bonus that you're unleashing the rook here on the F file. Okay, so really powerful move here, F5. All right, so black plays the move B4, continuing with their plan, trying to generate some counterplay which you can't blame them. I mean, there's not a lot else to do. If you take this, that's absolutely awful because the bishop takes and you still have the same problem and now there's no pawn to block the checkmate that we, we talked about and it's just, it's over for black. But I don't really know what black was gonna do instead. All right, so they played b4. And what would you do if you're playing here as white? Here's a good moment to pause and think about this. All right, well, hopefully you didn't say move your knight. Okay, this is, uh, I think a lot of beginners get into this habit of, a piece is attacked, they just immediately think that they have to move it. And you always wanna ask yourself the question, okay, I could move it to save the piece, but do I have a more powerful threat, right? That's the critical question. Do I have a more powerful threat? The answer is yes, F takes G6 is the move, and it continues to keep the pressure up. For example, if black takes here, if you wanna pause and work on your tactics, how can you finish off the game from here? All right, well, there's a couple of ways that you could do it, but probably the most obvious and simplest is to get rid of the knight because the knight is defending the checkmate square. After black recaptures with the other knight, you get rid of it again. And then after they capture, uh, well, they can't take your rook or you just simply checkmate. Okay, so they would have to take this way, but then you can simply bust through with the bishop again, threatening the checkmate. And the idea is that if they take you, you simply take with checkmate. Okay, so hopefully you were able to find that one. But that's the idea. That's why you don't even have to worry about your knight, essentially, because the, the attack is so much more powerful. So black takes back here with the pawn. And this is a, maybe a tricky move to find, but what do you think Pillsbury played here? All right, if you had a chance to look at that, the move is queen to h4. Now, remember what I said earlier. G6 created weaknesses on the dark squares. And what Pillsbury is doing is saying, okay, I was attacking these light squares this whole time, right? But now I see an opportunity to shift my focus and start attacking the dark squares. And a, just a simple queen move can accomplish that, right? And so keep that in mind, you, when you're attacking, it's okay to change your plan and be flexible and adapt to the weaknesses that your opponent creates, right? There wasn't dark square weaknesses initially when the pawn was on g7, but now that it's moved forward, guess what? Now we, we shift our focus. And that's what what's happening here. So now black said, uh, decides to go ahead and take the knight. They didn't really, have a whole lot of options anyway. And again, if you wanna work on your tactics, what do you think Pillsbury played next? All right, if you had a chance to look at that. So the move is simply uh, knight takes d7, right? And if you look at this position, one, two, three pieces are attacking the knight. One, two, three are defending it. But what you can do is remove one of the defenders. And actually it's even better than that. It's a bonus because you remove two defenders because when the queen recaptures, it's no longer, right? So even better. And by the way, if the knight tries to take, you walk into the, the fork here, that's no good for black and you're losing material, okay? So black takes with the queen. 
And here is another kind of tricky moment. What do you play here as white? All right, well, if you said bishop takes f6, you are wrong. And it's because in this particular position, the bishop is actually more valuable than the rook. Okay, so here's the deal. When you first learn chess, you learn what all the pieces are valued. Queen is worth nine, rook is worth five, bishops and knights are three, pawns are one. And you get in the habit of just like always thinking about that when you make trades, right? But that's just generally speaking, like most of the time, like 95% of the time, that's going to be true. However, there's always that five to 10% of the time when there's a something going on in the position when the bishop is better than the rook or the knight is better than the rook, right? And that's exactly what we see here. This position, the bishop sitting on f6 is so much more powerful than the rook. So for example, if we take with the bishop first, he takes, we take. Okay, it's not a bad position, but the rook can't really do anything to the king, right? Let's trade that around. If we take, he takes, we take. Look at this. There's checkmate and you can't stop it. The game is over if that happens, right? So that is why uh, you really have to think carefully about what is needed in the position and make sure you make the appropriate trades, even if normally you wouldn't give up a rook for a bishop, right? In this case, you, you would. Okay, so that's the idea. And because of that, black can't take it. Right? They can't take it or they just get checkmate. So they don't do that and they think, well, at least I got the knight, I lost the knight, it's just a trade at the end of the day, let's, let's keep going on. And they play the move a5. Now, a5 actually has an idea of rook a6 to come up here and start defending with the rook. So that's what they're planning on doing, get this, getting this rook, which is not doing anything involved in the game, okay? And um, if you want to pause, uh, this one's not, well, yeah, I'll just let you pause. What, what did he play next? All right, the move is rook a to f1. Now, there is, there is a checkmate with bishop takes g6, okay? But it's super long and complicated. The idea is that after the pawn takes, you can take here. King's going to try to run. You can go check. You can trade. You can go queen h5, which is an amazing move. Look at this. The king is basically trapped, so you try to block. But then rook e6 check. You can't take this because you're pinned now. You try to run, takes, checkmate. Okay, that was very long. There were some other lines there, too, that I didn't show you. But that's kind of the idea that Stockfish finds. Very, very long line to calculate. And so... What he does instead is just brings the rook over. And this is something that grandmasters do sometimes. Like they don't always go for the complicated, super nice 15 move checkmate if they don't have to. You, if you have a move like this, that's just gonna win you the game, just play that move. You don't have to like sit there and think for an hour, right? Just play the good move. So just something to keep in mind because if you, like if you, maybe you made a mistake in your calculation, you might actually lose a game that you were totally winning. And so that's why, you know, he just did this instead. Okay, rook to a6. And now he goes for the bishop capture, okay? The pawn takes. And there's actually a mate in seven from this position. I don't want you to pause here. If you want, you can. But I'm gonna actually show you a couple of moves because mate in seven, I think, is a bit advanced for a lot of the viewers here. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the first two moves. Rook takes, bishop takes. Then he sacrifices the rook, king takes, and now if you would like to pause, this is still re relatively difficult for a lot of people watching this, but it's mate in five, white to play, and this is kind of a good practice uh, to see if you can find it, okay? So go ahead and have a, you know, pause and see if you see that. All right, so if you had a chance to look at that, let me kind of talk through, if you were in this position and you're trying to think about, okay, how do I win the game? This is what your, your thought process should look like. I'm down a rook. But his king is exposed, and I have a queen and a bishop. So somehow I have to get checkmate. I'm not going to win the game by playing random moves like, oh, let me just take this pawn, and let me get my king to say, no, like you can immediately forget about those moves, right? You have to find checkmate. That's the first thing. Now, how do we do that? Well, bishop there. Okay, you start with the checks. So I'm going to start with the check. Bishop there, no. He just takes me, I lose a piece. That makes no sense. Bishop here. Eh, okay, maybe, but do I have something more powerful? I'm going to look at the queen checks. Here, here here and here. So you basically come up with a list of moves and then you start one at a time until you find the best one, okay? Now, for some people this is difficult, and but you have to train. This is how you wanna train your brain, right? These moves, I don't know that they look very good because he blocks with his queen and then I'm like, okay, okay I don't know. The queen's pretty good defender of the king. I don't think I wanna let his queen get right next to his king to defend. I'm down a rook, remember, right? 
Queen h6, kind of a similar thing. He brings the queen over and he defends. So by process of elimination, I can very quickly kind of eliminate these moves and say, okay, queen h8 is probably the best one because that's the only move where his queen can't defend his king, okay? Only move, king f7. Now, what do we do? Again, same kind of thing. All right, let me look at the checks. And by the way, looking at checks or captures is a, is a great place to start. Check here almost looks pretty good, but no, there's a rook there that's just going to take me, so that's no good. Let's see, check, no, 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 he just takes me. So the only check is queen h7. Again, by process of elimination, this is kind of the only move I can play. Queen h7 check, okay? He go, uh, if he moves here, this one should be relatively straightforward for you guys. That's correct. Queen takes g6 is checkmate. Look at this, bishop. Look at the pawn. Look at the queen. Everything is controlled. And that is simply checkmate. Okay, so you have to be able to see these mate and ones really quickly so that you can put it together and find the more complicated ones. If he goes here, you need to be able to see that checkmate right away. That's right. Queen here is checkmate. Look at that. Okay, so because of that, only move for the king is to go back to, oops, not, not there, sorry, is to go back to f8. Okay, mate in three from here. And by the way, even if you didn't see the checkmate, if you saw to this point, that's fine because you can see, okay, I take the queen and now I'm just in a winning position. Totally fine, right? But the follow-up is that black has no checks to your king. Even if they like push or take or whatever, trying to get a queen, it doesn't matter. You now have a forced checkmate with the queen and the bishop. You go bishop h6 check, forces the king here, and then checkmate, okay? And, and like I said, you didn't have to see that whole line. You could have, by process of elimination, sort of, okay, I have to go here, I have to go here, I have to go here. Now, I think most likely that Pillsbury did see uh, from this position everything. He did see, like, if I take this, okay, a threatening checkmate, he's got to take me back. And then he probably started calculating, and I think he probably did see it, but or, or at least from right here before he sacked the rook, you know. But you get the idea. You can do it by process of elimination. Okay, so let's just recap the Pillsbury attack for a second, because that was a really, really great um, example game. You jump the knight into e5. The idea behind that is so you want to play f4, okay? You push the pawn to f4, you're going to recapture with the f pawn, open up the rook if they ever take you. You can bring your queen over, you can bring your rook up, and you have a lot of pieces that are ready to attack, right? And you just start looking for weaknesses, and that's, that's what he did. He looked for the weaknesses, he put the pressure on them, and then he adapted. Okay, well, you're going to play g6. I'll use this as an opportunity to continue attacking. And then at the right moment, he shifted the focus to the dark squares and then found some really nice tactics to finish off the game. Okay, that's it. That's the Pillsbury attack. This was episode 22 in our series. If you enjoyed this, make sure you get ready for next week. Game 23 is on page 148. Thank you, guys, and I'll see you next time. Stay sharp. Play smart and take care.